Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Luke. Uh, as you were saying, and as we sort of, uh, Alex was talking about yesterday, um, I'm going to be talking about this project, which is adding the CRI mechanism to UKCA, uh, which has been a project which has taken up the better, past, the better part of the last what, four years, I think now. Um, and it's now at the point where we're sort of, you know, we're using it for real research and we're, it's, we've got a paper which is nearly past review, uh, should be published soon. Um, <clears throat> and it is ready to use uh, for anyone who is interested. And so we really think that this could be like a big forefront in capability um, for the UKCA and its uses within the UM and UKSM1, which kind of sets it apart from um, the, uh, the other, other global models, global interactive models um, that we're competing with. And so yeah, you know, I'll talk you through Today I'm going to be talking a bit more about the sort of development process than I would do normally, given that I've got a bit more time. Uh, so happy to answer questions about that. Um, I probably wouldn't really recommend doing what I did, which is sort of adding a wholesale chemical mechanism to the UKCA. Uh, there have been various challenges along the way in doing so. Uh, but now that it is there, I would say it's a very good template that we can build on and use for some like really exciting new science. Um, so, to talk about, you know, what are we, what are we sort of interested in here? Um, so, the general scientific field that we're working in is looking at this, you know, um, chemistry and aerosol interactions with climate. Um, and so, what you're looking at, you're looking at these emissions from various different sources, like agriculture, factories, towns cities, ships, airplanes, which will get mixed into the atmosphere. They'll undergo, um, those primary pollutants will undergo chemical processes to convert them into secondary pollutants such as ozone and various secondary um, aerosols, inorganic and organic aerosols. And these secondary pollutants is what will cause issues in terms of air pollution, uh, they could cause damages to uh, the biosphere and agriculture, and they'll also feed back with climate, particularly things like aerosols will affect the way lights, um, whereas something like ozone is a greenhouse gas. And so there's lots of little complex chemistry and also interactions with the environment. And you also have to think about how all these things are transported. Um, one of the things you're sort of most interested in, particularly in terms of what fed the development of the CRI mechanism in the first place is production of tropospheric ozone. Um, so this is sort of a very, very simplified um, cartoon of what happens, which is, you know, you'll get a VOC and it will be oxidized by an oxidant, generally OH, ozone or NO3, and it will form peroxy radicals, HO2 and RO2, which can convert NO to NO2 and then when that NO2 is photolyzed, it can form ozone. And, you know, just taking an example of the sort of simplest VOC being um, methane, and you get this um, <coughs> catalytic cycles, which can convert NO to NO2, producing ozone and recycling that NO, as long as you have those proxy radicals to react with. Um, and in a way, the ozone is sort of byproduct of these, ozone, these oxidation reactants. And this is the sort of largest source of ozone in the troposphere. Um, and you, you can sort of look at these other ways, which is that you need this kind of mixture of NOx and VOCs in order to efficiently form ozone. And it's quite a complex system. So if you're in a very like VOC limited region, actually adding more NOx can actually decrease ozone because that NOx will titrate it away. And similarly, if you've got very high VOC low NOx regions. And so you kind of need this sort of sweet spot of a good combination of VOCs and NOx in order to have efficient ozone production, as well as uh, good photolytic conditions. Um, all of that kind of hides a great deal of complexity though. And so when you're talking about organic species, 
um, the complexity and possible combinations of them increases exponentially as you increase the number of carbon atoms. And so, you know, the, the system can be fairly simple if you're looking at things like methane and CO, but as soon as you start looking at things like even, even things like butanes and butene and C4 species, it gets very complicated. When you're looking at biogenic species of so things like isoprene and alpha pinene, alpha pinene, you really are forced to do quite heavy parameterizations in order to have something which is functional uh, in the model. Um, so we know that there's many thousands of VSC species. Um, there's this deep necessity to simplify that chemistry if you want to have a functioning model. Um, but the question is, how do you know that those simplifications preserve the key processes? Um, so to get a bit more philosophical here, um, I quite like this illustration. This is Tracy Emmons' bed that she won a turn of with uh, many years ago. If we think of that as being reality, a model is more like this. It's a stark simplification <coughs> of what is what is going on. Um, and I'm sure you've all probably seen this quote before. Uh, essentially, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, models are by definition simplifications of reality, and they have to be. Um, that's a you know, that's a key part of them. If they weren't simplified, then they wouldn't be useful. Um, and so the question then becomes, if it, for it to be useful, you have to be sure that it captures the key processes that you're interested in and the areas in which it has simplified, you know, at least aren't really doing harm for the scientific questions that you're trying to tackle. And so in many ways, um, you know, having something which is more complicated isn't necessarily better because that means that it has more degrees of freedom. Um, but then it may be a case that, and for many times having something which is very, very simple, but can capture the key bits that you want is probably the best thing that you could use. Um, but then you also have to acknowledge that that's going to have certain blind spots and there's going to be certain conditions in which you can use that simple model. And if you go outside of those conditions, then you're going to get into trouble. So in terms of how these, the development of chemistry in models has often progressed, um, this is a kind of a, a straw man of how the development of the structural mechanism has happened. Um, so they're taking fundamental parameters. Uh, these would be coming from um, <coughs> large databases uh, such as uh, IEPAC or uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the NASA, they um, have a set of these databases which will be used from chamber studies in order to uh, give you sort of basic parameters for um, sort of rate coefficients of key chemical reactions. And you'll take these and you'll put them into the model and you try and ignore the ones that you don't think are important, include the ones that you do think are important. Um, you start implying these um, <clears throat> into a, maybe a box model or into a 3D model. And then usually once this is all inside that big 3D model, then you'll evaluate it against observations. So things like satellite data or surface data or um, into two flights. Um, of course, when you're doing that with these big 3D models, it's very hard to differentiate between what is being caused by your chemical mechanism and what are errors which are due to things like your emissions or due to your transport or due to your um, <coughs> convective parameterization or your boundary layer parameterization or a whole host of other issues or the resolution of your model. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what you're sort of limited to with this sort of approach. Um, and then what usually happens is that people will say, oh, this new paper has come out. It shows that this new chemical reaction is really important. We want to see whether it has an effect. And so you'll do these sensitivity experiments where you'll add a new chemical reaction or a new set of chemical reactions and species and you'll add them to the final parameters and go through this loop again. Um, but you don't sort of know, you know, you can easily get into a situation where you add an extra bit of chemistry and it actually makes things worse. 
but you can say well what's happening you're making something which is more complex more realistic in some regards but then that's actually compensating for some errors which are already in there and so it gets you can very easily get into a kind of tangle when you're developing these already very complex systems um, to add extra chemistry uh, that you that you're interested in and so you have this sort of problem of traceability you don't really know um, because you sort of started off with this already simplified mechanism you don't know how those changes that you're making are affecting the whole system um, and you have these sort of risks of compounding errors so it is, it is a very difficult problem all things considered i think stratrop is a very good model for what it does um, but it's it's very difficult to evaluate that in a systematic way and so what's happening what, what happened with the development of the CRI mechanism that stands for common representative intermediates mechanism um, is it starts from the master chemical mechanism which is uh, this massive very complex um, chemical mechanism made up of thousands of species and tens of thousands of reactions which again have been built from laboratory studies, theoretical semi-empirical methods, and all these rate constants, and undergone a whole series of chamber validations. And what happens then is that the CRI mechanism is a simplified version of the MCM. But in every stage of that simplification process, this mechanism reduction, it gets compared against the full MCM, it gets compared against chamber validation, um, and it makes sure that it can recreate the key things that you're interested in, the main one being ozone formation for in terms of what drove the CRI mechanism development. Um, and so you kind of go through this cycle here to make sure that it's always tied in with any one particular um, <clears throat> version of the MCM. Uh, <clears throat> And so you can sort of say that each version of the CLI is equivalent to a version of the MCM. And that gives you this sort of traceability back to it, uh, which is a very strong thing, because you can then say that you know that the tropospheric ozone that's being formed from the CLI is equivalent to what you would get if you had the same, that equivalent version of the MCM in your model. Um, <laughs> Obviously, the MCM isn't perfect, uh, but it is a very useful way of at least reducing your uncertainty within your ozone, within the um, ozone forming chemistry in the troposphere. So to look at how this simplification process works. Uh, what we have here in this blue section is um, this oxidation of a C6 alkane. Um, and this would be the equivalent within the CRI. And in these oxidation pathways, what generally happens is you, you oxidize, <clears throat> you do the initial oxidation step with OH, um, that, will that will form an RO2, uh, it will take on an, an oxygen atom pretty much instantly. Um, and it, within the MCM, there'll be lots of different isomers which will be formed here with, with you know, different locations in which um, <coughs> the OH abstraction occurs. Whereas within the CRI, these, oops, sorry, these intermediate steps get merged um, and you get these sort of weird, these are actually the common intermediates. Um, these species, which is like a jumble of numbers and letters. Um, what this is saying, uh, this is saying that it's um, an RN. Um, <clears throat> like a, 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 just an alkane chain, which has then got a, an alkyl chain, which has got, can form 19 potential ozone molecules. And that 19 will come from the total number of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds within the molecule. And then the fact that it has no two at the end tells you that it's proxy radical. And so by lumping all of these things together, um, based on their potential to form ozone, 
they found over time that if you do that, you can actually massively reduce the number of these different intermediate species um, by, by generally like over an order of magnitudes without actually changing any of the ozone warming potential. So these uh, things will then go, undergo sort of similar kinds of NO to NO2 conversions. Each time an NO2, NO2 conversion happens, this CLI index will move down by one because that's in effect created one ozone molecule um, as that NO2 photolyzes. <clears throat> and so, first of all, the first main step is this sort of reduction of all these intermediate species. There's a second set of reductions, which is where primary emitted VOCs are also lumped together. But as, as I was saying, at each step of these reductions, um, is there's a rigorous series of evaluations against the MCM to make sure that ozone production and other key chemical processes are conserved. <clears throat> and so you might see me start talking about what I call here, so CRI version 2.1 R5. Uh, this one is traceable to the MCM version 3.2. And the R5 means that it's the fifth reduction. So that's actually the simplest version. So each stage of reduction, you, move, you lose a little bit of accuracy but it's still something like 98% um, accurate compared to the MCM in terms of ozone formation, which is um, really, really, really strong. Um, what I did was I added this into the model um, and you can sort of see here, there's a, like a big step up in terms of number of species. In order for it to work within a, th a full 3D um, model, I also needed to add stratospheric chemistry because the CRI scheme is only for tropospheric chemistry. Um, so the stratospheric chemistry is copied from the original Stratrop um, in order for it to be used in sort of an earth system mode. And so that extends the number of species a little bit. And then finally, there's the coupling with GLOMAP, which uses some of the species which are already in um, the CRI mechanism, but adding uh, conversion for them into aerosols. Uh, so this cryostrat with uh, GLOMAP mode is the main one which I've been talking about here. And you can see that it's an, a step up of, well, more than double number of species and the number of reactions. This is a brief summary of sort of key additional chemistry, uh, which we have in this mechanism, which isn't in Stratrop. So things like alkanes and alkenes all the way up to C4. You've got lots of aromatics and EB, VOC chemistry. Um, <clears throat> and you also get a lot more of these like organonitrates being formed. So there's a lot more potential for um, nitrogen, reactive nitrogen. Um, so I've gone blank. Um, reservoir species to be formed, which enables the transport of these uh, away from pollution sources. Um, so I'll probably talk a little bit, bit, bit more here about how this is actually implemented. Uh, I would like to say that it was um, more intelligent than this, but to be frank, a lot of it really was brute force and I'd really have to call it Alice and Bob on steroids. Um, so it really was following this kind of step-by-step -step process of Adding a new species, adding new species to the SASH master file, also adding their sort of mass and C conversion values, adding bimolecular, termolecular photolysis reactions for each of them, uh, where possible, using existing reactions, um, making emission files for all the emissions that are emitted, which didn't previously exist, adding wet and dry deposition coefficients for each of them. Um, as I said, copying the stratospheric and aerosol chemistry as required. And then from there, it's simply a case of testing, running, debugging, what have you. As we say, um, the cry mechanism is very appropriately named. This is quite a painful process at times. Uh, but I would say that the UKCA training course exercises were absolutely invaluable in this entire process. Um, it does create a template for adding new chemistry which you really can just do as a tick box exercise and follow. Um, and you can get into a lot of trouble if you don't do that. So I really, I really would recommend this course. This is what I did when I first started and it, and it helped a lot. Um, not all of this was automatic. Um, a lot of the times I actually was writing 
um, Python scripts to automatically write Fortran code, which then I was then using. In fact, most of it was written like that, um, but there were enough details and ironing out that the process took, unfortunately, a lot longer than might be suspected if you just did that. But if anyone does have, say, KPP code and wants to write it out into, um, into the Fortran that you need for developing the mechanism, then I, I do have a whole series of scripts which can uh, aid in that. So in terms of the stash master changes, um, I added a new chemical scheme. So if you know, notice when you had this, you always had like a one here. That says in this long string, that tells you to use it in the strap chop chemical mechanism. Essentially counting from the right, each of these is a different chemical mechanism. So I added one in the next one on that list. And so there's a potential for like a whole series of more chemical mechanisms that could be added or sort of variations in existing mechanisms if you wanted to do that. Um, I, in, in terms of where these things went, uh, I was at the time actually limited to everything having to be up to um, section index 255 out of, in section 34, if I wanted them to be transported species. Uh, so there was a lot of fiddling around to make sure that I could get the entire mechanism into that limited area. There was a time when it looked as I was going to have to cut some corners, but it managed to get it all to fit in the end. Um, since then, it's actually been extended up to um, S34 I500, which means there's a lot more space to add traces now if people wanted to. I think that's kind of my fault for using up all the space that was there beforehand. Um, <clears throat> in terms of there's also this section, which is in the latter half of S34, uh, which I've used for new peroxy radicals. Now, I actually had to define a new type of species in order for this to work. Uh, so these proxy radicals are generally very reactive and short lived, which means you don't actually have to transport them. Uh, they can just be, they can just work as normal chemical species. But we realized in terms of how UKCA has put together these couldn't be steady state species, um, unfortunately. Uh, so I had to actually define a new type, which basically is that they're not transported. So they're not seen by uh, the transport mechanism, the transport uh, processes within the model, but the actual UKCA chemistry treats them like normal species. And they also undergo their own sets of reactions. And so that's, again, this is the same index as you have for the transported species, but they have an eight here instead. And that's basically just to signify that these are proxy radicals. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of coding went into this. It's probably the sort of most technical side of the that I did. Uh, likewise for the chemistry, these are what the sort of KPP files that I start was working from. Uh, you can just download this from the CRI website. Um, and this got changed into the sort of UKCA chem master code that you're used to seeing. And so for here, we've got these little um, little signifiers, which you probably would have seen in the um, as a, the, 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 sorry, the changes to UKCA chem master that you've been making. You always want to have a little ST there, which is saying that's being used in a strap trot mechanism. So I created another one, which is called CS. And you can also see that you can add these together. That's saying that this reaction exists in both, you know, the tropospheric and the stratospheric and the um, CS and quite strats. Um, there are also ex other examples where we have these little signifiers like the A, which tells you to include or exclude it for the aerosol chemistry. So if it's the one on the left, that means you use it in the aerosol, if you're running with aerosol, if that A is on the right, so it goes zero A, that means that you um, only use it if you're not running with aerosol. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the emissions, there's uh, quite a lot of big changes that went on here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things to note with Strat-Trop is that it doesn't have different isomers for, sorry, it doesn't have, um, <clears throat> Uh, for, for example, for your um, VOCs with two carbon atoms, 
um, it only has ethane, so C2H6, whereas Christ, Christratz has got um, ethane, ethene, ethine. <coughs> and it's similar for um, propane and propene, butanes and butenes as well. So you have this, in terms of Strattrop, all of these emissions, which are coming from the separate files, get added together and lumped together. Whereas in Christratz, they're all treated as separate species. And there are also a number of species like the aromatics, which are in Christratz, but are not in Strattrop at all. And so that actually changes the total amounts of non-methyl VOCs that are being added into the model. Um, so just to show you sort of what that looks like, these are your anthropogenic um, C2 emissions. Uh, Strattrop has got all of these added together, whereas um, in Christrat, you've got separate files for ethine, ethene, and ethane. And you can actually see some differences in the distribution um, of the emissions uh, of these different species. Uh, so you can expect that to have some influence on the chemistry that happens. Um, similarly for your biogenic species, so within Strattrop, everything is lumped into this big monoterp tracer, whereas in Strattrop we've got uh, two thirds of it is going mapped to alpha pinene and one third is being mapped to beta pinene. And you have actually some very big differences in the monoterpene chemistry between these mechanisms. So within Strattrop, there's a very, very simple parameterization, which just oxidizes your monoterp uh, to the SECORG tracer, which forms SOA with a biostand of the 13% yield, which for some reason is doubled later on in the codes to 26. Um, <clears throat> in Christrat, you actually have detailed multi-generational chemistry for all of your alpha pinene and beta pinene um, species. So these will form more of these intermediates and those intermediates will undergo several more stages of oxidation. Um, <clears throat> in order to couple this with the aerosol scheme, um, I kind of did a bit of a hack here really, which is that I also copied this 13% yield of second SECORG uh, from each of these first steps in oxidation, and then allowed the gas phase to continue as it would do otherwise, um, <clears throat> which isn't, massively realistic but it at least means that I'm recreating the same um, secondary organic aerosol production as you would get in strap drop assuming same oxygen fields. Um, so this is something which is suitable for what we're doing right now and my focus so far has mostly been on the gas phase rather than on the aerosol phase. Um, James Weber is actually working a lot more developments um, on this side of the model and hopefully in time that will lead to a more realistic description of secondary organic aerosol. Although I'm sure as many of you know that is a very difficult scientific problem and it's gonna take a, we're not expecting to sort of solve it in one step, unfortunately. So you can see here what I've done is I've sort of copied each of these, um, added that extra second of tracer, added a 13% yield in these numbers here. Um, one last sort of bit of major developments that I did was this RO2 chemistry. Um, this required a lot of changes like deep inside the model and it's probably the tracing and toughest thing that I did. So uh, again, taking this example of the methyl proxy radical, um, so simplest case, these will undergo reactions with themselves, but they can also react with all other proxy radicals. So within Strattrop, um, these separate reactions um, are hard coded. Now, if you've got, you know, five, 10 proxy radicals, that's not too hard to, come to write those all in. But if you've got 50 proxy radicals, which is, you know, basically the case of Christrat, then you can't do all those different permutations. You just get, you know, it's like an N factorial problem. Um, and so this approximation, which uh, Mike Jenkin managed to develop a while ago in developing the MCM and the CRA mechanism, is to have this RO2 pool, which is just defined as the sum of all proxy radicals. And then you can allow each proxy radical 
to have this sort of pseudo reaction where it reacts with that RO2 pool to form its products, um, um, where that RO2 pool is defined as the sum of all the proxy radicals, but it doesn't actually um, get lost within these reactions. It just gets recalculated at the end of every iteration of the chemical solver. So it's a very comprehensive representation of this huge field of RO2 chemistry with actually very little additional cost. Um, and actually, I added this to the model for Stratrop as well. And um, by adding this and removing the RO2 transport, it actually means that the model speeds up by about 2 to 3%. So how much does this all cost? As I was saying, this is over twice as expensive. Rather than the tests uh, with it on Monsoon 2, and we can actually see that Strat, Strat is about 80% slower than strap drop um, for running a single month and honestly this is quite a big win um, I, well, before i did this stuff i was really scared it was going to be a hell of a lot more difficult to run um, but actually when you consider how much more complicated it is being less than double as expensive is a pretty pretty big win um, it's not cheap, but if you think about it, if you can, if you're happy to run two experiments with strat drop, then you can run one experiment with cry strat. And so, you know, while we're not expecting this to be a complete wholesale replacement of strat drop straight away, um, we think it's pretty feasible that this could be used as a as a standard or you know one that we can use in some detailed studies to test strat drop against. Um, and hopefully in like maybe like UK SM2, we'll be doing a lot more experiments using uh, Christrat. Um, so just moving on to the next part of the talk, which is going to be just looking a bit how, what differences happen when you add this Christrat chemistry uh, to the model. So I've got these experiments where I've been just been running it for 10 years, uh, from 2009 to 2019, using nudged meteorology. Um, my main two experiments are just simply called Cry-Strat and Strat-Trop. Uh, but I've also done two extra experiments, which are calling the Strat-Trop emiss and C2-C3 emiss. Um, both of these have the same total amount of carbon emissions from your NMVOC species as the Strat-Trop mechanism. But for CRI emiss Strat-Trop, uh, they have the same speciations in Strat-Trop, whereas in C2-C3, these are speciated to Christrat species. So your ethane has been split into ethine, ethene and ethane. And these are used to differentiate the impact of chemistry versus the additional NMVOC emissions that happens in the Christrat scheme. So this is a comparison with uh, the Tor ozone surface measurement database. And I don't know if you remember from Alex's talk yesterday, he was saying that there's this general problem about in many places where summer ozone is overestimated and winter ozone is underestimated. And you can sort of see that in the blue line, which is strat drop. And then Christrat, you actually just generally see this sort of increase in surface ozone uh, fair in most places in the world, actually. And so what that does in effect is it increases this um, high bias in the summer, but lowers the winter bias. But really, that's just sort of shifting that distribution up. Unfortunately, it doesn't particularly change the shape of that distribution. So we can sort of say from that, from that the shape of that distribution might be more due to other aspects of the uh, model as opposed to the chemical mechanism itself. Um, <clears throat> That was looking at surface ozone. This is looking at tropospheric column compared to the OMI-MLS uh, satellite product. Um, and interestingly, you actually get a very similar burden uh, between, <laughs> between all of these. So there's large differences in surface ozone become a lot more minimal when you look at total tropospheric column. Um, you actually have to have like a different scale here to really sort of see the differences in Christrat versus Strat-Trop. And when you do that, you do see that Christrat has got 
more ozone being produced in the polluted northern hemisphere, but less in the southern hemisphere, which is more dominated uh, by biogenic emissions. <clears throat> and generally more remote. <clears throat> um, we can dig a bit more into your and into the ox production and loss. So we see here that the ozone burden is fairly similar, strap drop actually slightly higher. Um, but what hap what's happening is that in the cryo strap mechanism, you're getting a hell of a lot more production, but also a lot more loss compared to strap drop. Um, and we actually see that a large chunk of these additional loss pathways are due to this uh, loss due to O single D plus water, which is what forms uh, the OH radical. <clears throat> um, we can also say that we can look at how much of these additional production, which is occurring in cryostrats, is due to the emissions versus what's due to the chemistry. And so if you take this example of uh, strap drop with um, CRI with strap drop emissions, uh, you see that even there you do actually get more um, ozone production, but also more ozone loss. And you actually see that this loss pathway due to ozone D is also very high. And so that result means that if you actually have exactly the same emissions in CRI as strap drop, you actually get quite a lot less of a total ozone burden. But the chemistry is still hotter, you get more ozone production and loss. Um, uh, these are ozone isopleths, uh, where you can sort of look at the surface ozone um, phase space compared to your emissions of NOx and VOCs. And you can, you can really see these, like, there's a general shift um, in your peak ozone production distribution within these, <coughs> within these, um, for scenarios uh, with <clears throat> cryostrat having a much larger production at higher VOC and NOx uh, regions, which is partly just due to we actually have more regions with high VOC emissions. Uh, but even when you have exactly the same emissions, cryostrat does have a different distribution of production compared to strut drop. Um, we can see these sort of changes in ozone production and loss. Um, but this loss, which is much higher within the CRI ones, is actually really is tied down to this O single D plus H2O uh, reaction pathway. And so digging into that, uh, we actually realized that um, some of these reactions are simply different. They just have different reaction rate coefficients between the two mechanisms. Um, and it's a bit frustrating this, we actually see that O single D is about 25% more likely to react with water in CRI compared to strap drop. And the difference is basically just due to the different reaction rate coefficients that the two mechanisms use. Um, they've just had different development histories and it's kind of, in some ways, it's hard to say which one is necessarily right. Um, although some of these reaction rates have been updated in uh, the latest version of uh, CRI, CRI version 2.2, which James has been working with. Um, so unfortunately, this does actually change a hell of a lot of the chemistry that we're interested in, in a way which is um, changing the inorganic chemistry, which is not necessarily the focus, which was more in the organic chemistry. Uh, but so it goes. Um, one side effect of this as well is that we also get more um, <coughs> um, hydroxy radical production, uh, particularly near the surface. And so this has changes to your Hox budgets and we generally see more OH near the surface, but less uh, in more remote regions, partly, um, but generally more HO2, more or less everywhere. And that's gonna have changes to your oxidation budget and it's gonna affect species like carbon monoxide, um, <clears throat> which are primarily oxidized via OH. On the other hand, you also get a lot more carbon monoxide production, and that production is happening due to your additional VOC emissions. Um, these are just a compar comparison of various surface sites. Um, but in these regions here, um, in sort of southern hemisphere, you get uh, quite a large increase in your CO. So you generally see 
in Stratrop, there's this sort of low bias in, in CO in most Northern Hemispheric regions that's been reduced slightly within Christstrat. But then in many of these remote regions, you get, uh, or biogenically dominated regions, you get a lot more CO in Christstrat. So again, you kind of have, you know, a reduction in biases in some regions and a, a worsening in other regions, unfortunately. Um, but as you're saying, generally speaking, an increase in CO, but the main increase being over the southern hemisphere. Um, I know I'm sort of started a little bit late, but I'm going to try and sort of wrap up soon now. Um, <clears throat> one of the other major areas in which we see a huge difference is in your NOY budget. So NOY being the sum of NO, NO2 in all of its reservoir species. Uh, where the reservoirs are sometimes called NOZ. <clears throat> and within Christ Strats, what's happening is that you've got actually a lot less NO and NO2 within the mechanism, um, but that's being converted into uh, your reservoir species. And so you get this buildup of a lot more reservoirs, particularly because they can form more our, our NO2 species. Um, Within the ones in which you have the same emissions as Stratrop, um, you actually just generally get less NOx and NOY in general. And a big part of this is actually due to there being a faster production of nitric acid. Um, and so I'm probably going to skim through this because it's getting a bit detailed. Um, but yeah, you can sort of see a larger proportion within the main Stratrop mechanism of this being stored in organic uh, reservoir species, whereas within the other ones, you get more of it being stored as nitric acid. Um, and again, there are a number of differences in the uh, reaction rate coefficients for some of these inorganic reactions, which changes your production of nitric acid, particularly near the surface. Um, <clears throat> again, it's frustrating, uh, but the mechanisms are just different. Um, so that's more or less um, what we've got so far. Most of what I've presented is in a paper which is in review and is going to be published very soon. Um, we've added this comprehensive mechanism built from the CRI 2.1, which we've called Christstrat with the addition of the stratospheric chemistry. Um, <clears throat> It provides a much more detailed representation of VOCs using the full emission data. And a big advantage is this traceability to the master chemical mechanism. So we hope it could be used as a benchmark for uh, future developments. Um, the fact that it has this additional chemistry also means that we're going to have these really potential to have much more realistic links between chemistry and the soil formation. Um, in terms of the chemistry that goes on in there already, you would imagine a lot of these benefits will um, <clears throat> have much greater impact once you get to higher resolution, uh, particularly as the COI was more developed with urban um, and biogenic chemistry in mind. Um, it is slower, but with it being about 80% slower, uh, we still think this is efficient enough for long runs and high res runs are also possible and being planned. Um, Again, we do hit this sort of problem in which we really don't necessarily improve things like ozone, CO, and these other common metrics. But I would put that down to say that these highlight larger structural errors in the model. And we do see this sort of strongest sensitivity to emissions. And so any uncertainty in those emissions could be amplified. Um, and again, it kind of gets this back to this problem of that it's very difficult to evaluate a full 3D model when you're just comparing it against surface and satellite measurements. So we've got various threads of this being carried on. Um, James Weber in particular is uh, got a version, an updated version of the CRI mechanism, which sort of came out um, part way through when I was doing my development work. Um, and it offers several advantages. It's had an update some of the reaction rate coefficients, which reduces some of the differences that we I was showing earlier, um, but it also updates the isoprene chemistry with our latest understanding, particularly of Hox recycling, and that has some uh, really quite big impacts on uh, the oxygen budget, uh, which has implications for things like um, aerosol formation. <clears throat> 
So um, that he's writing on work in the paper with that, and that should be uh, submitted fairly soon. It's all pretty good work, exciting work. Um, in terms of what I've got here, the Christrat standard mechanism that I presented is usable. Uh, I would recommend only using it after version 11.7 because there was a major bug fix uh, which I committed. And these are the ticket numbers if you want to see more details. And the paper is in preprint and you can download it online, uh, but it should be finally published very soon. Um, so if you get any more questions, anyone who wants to use it is ready to go. So please just email to me to get in contact. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to ask. Thanks, Scott. That's great. Um, I see we've got a hand. Uh, Paul? Thank you, Scott. That was a really great presentation and uh, what a heroic effort um, putting that scheme into UKCA. Um, it, uh, the, mind, the, the amount of work and the complexity is just mind-boggling. So a brilliant job. Well done. Um, Scott, you, um, you didn't say too much about the um, the, the way um, CRI works with GLOMAP, uh, that, I guess that works probably at a fairly easy stage, uh, early stage. Uh, but I just wondered if there are any, any comments about. Um, I mean, does does it is it is it now fully coupled and working with GLOMAP? Um, so, uh, in short, yes, um, it it copies the same. So essentially, it uses the same interactions of GloMap that Strattrop does. And so it's just a case of if it produces the same um, chemical species that are capable of condensing onto aerosol, then those will condense onto aerosol. So it's got its own DMS and SO2 oxidation, which is slightly different to uh, Strattrop, but ultimately those are going to form uh, sulfuric acid, which can condense to form sulfate aerosol. Um, I sh talked you through the changes to the um, monoterpene chemistry, so the alpha pinene and beta pinene, those will form secorg, that secorg can then form um, yeah. soa. And um, at the moment, there is still no um, ammonium nitrate, unfortunately, but it does have ammonia in it. So if, you know, once Strattrop has got um, ammonium nitrate formation, then by default, we should be able to add that to Chrysrat as well pretty straightforwardly. Um, so yeah, I as I would say, it is there. It also has the same heterogeneous chemistry that Strattrop does to things like um, N205 heterogeneous chemistry is done in the same way. Um, I guess the issue that we kind of have really is that like the gas phase chemistry has moved on to this stage, which is a much more explicit, much more realistic, but the formation of, so, so particularly for the um, alpha pine and beta pine in oxidation, monoterpene chemistry, uh, but the coupling of that to glow map is still very basic. And so there's, there's a bit of a sort of internal contradiction there, I guess. Uh, between the comprehensiveness of the um, gas phase chemistry and the aerosol coupling for organic aerosols. Um, but as I said, that's a, that's a pretty big problem. And uh, it was just way beyond the scope of what I was doing to be able to fix this time around. So my aim was kind of more to try and keep these other variables as similar to Strattrop as possible in order to enable easy comparison rather than trying to get something which is right straight away if that makes sense sure <laughs> i don't know if you're aware of the work that anthony jones at the met office has been doing to put um um nitrate uh, a nitrate scheme into into glow map um, uh, i've heard that things are ongoing but i don't really know yeah. the details so i, th I yeah. believe it's been committed actually scott the night the, oh, yeah. the structural scheme has uh, the nitrate scheme has gone in although it still i think needs a bit more validation before it can be signed off yeah but um i, I guess um I, I guess going forwards it, it would it would from what you've said it would be it would be obviously more work but possible to um um to to couple um cri to uh to, to that new scheme as well 
I mean, as long as the changes are more in the glow map side, it should be fairly straightforward. It's only really if change, there are more changes to the gas phase chemistry side. Yeah. It might no, be I, I, I think Anthony, Anthony, I don't think he's changed the gas phase chemistry. He's using Stratrop and um, I think all these changes are, are in glow map. Yeah. In which yeah. case, I think most of the changes will just be to um, sort of name list options and things yeah. like that, just to make sure that that coupling occurs, because the the connections already exist. Great. Thank you, Scott. I can see we've got another couple of hands. Uh, Florin, I think you were next. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. And uh, yeah, congrats, Scott. It's a very amount, big amount of work here. Uh, my question is more gener um, like top level, um, mm -hmm. because uh, yesterday in Alex's talk, there were a bit of um, uh, this table summarizing what you guess it is and what is the vision for the future. And there were mention of a kind of three configuration, one full complexity, one intermediate, and one simpler version of UKC. So in that vision, does it mean that CRI, CRI, is meant to be the default full complexity and something like Stratrop will be the intermediate, or it's a different strategy but uh, is uh, planned? Uh, that would be more or less my understanding. Um, yeah, like I think the the plan is to move on, move over to this being the sort of gold standard. Um, if not the version that I put in, um, the version that James has, has got, which is a bit more up to date. Um, <clears throat> and that being, as you say, the full complexity scheme, but without there being an expectation of that being used for all UK SM ones. Um, so it'd probably be a case of that being used for a few of them, but that could then be used to, uh, as a standard that you could evaluate the other ones against. Um, does that make sense? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it depends on which framework you're looking at this. Um, so from a, from a sort of fundamental chemistry perspective, something like the COI would be termed like an intermediate complexity scheme um, because it's sort of designed to sit in between sort of what is commonly used in 3D models and MCM, which really can only be used in box models. Um, and but it's designed to be sort of cheap enough that it can be used in 3D models but for them from a 3D model perspective it's you know pretty much at the cutting edge of uh, what we're what we're technically capable of doing at the moment and so yeah I guess I guess the idea is to move over to that being the gold standard um, default yeah yeah I'm asking because uh... I mean, eighty percent is already expensive, especially when you have to produce yeah. forecasts rapidly. But um, it's already very good, and uh, we know that our yeah. supercomputer is always uh, improving, so uh, yeah. it's already getting very likely to be used rapidly. But I guess yeah, it depends also on how the climate community, the choice they make, because if they decide that CRI could be the um, the gold standard. I wonder what structure would be and if it's going to be supported uh, in the long run. So, I think it's going to be supported for a while to come, at least. Um, and at the end of the day, sort of what is a suitable mechanism to use depends a lot on what the scientific questions that you're trying to tackle mm. are. That's true. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's ever really going to be a situation where Chrysler is the only mechanism that people are going to be wanting to use within the sort of UK SM community, because there's going to be a lot of interest in, you know, you know, other examples where really, maybe you only really want like a very basic offline oxidants model or um, stratospheric scheme for, for what you're looking at. So you don't really need to have this sort of full blown complexity of the troposphere. Um, but yeah, I think the idea is to move towards COI being the sort of the gold standard, but within the sort of hierarchy of other possible configurations. Good, thanks. And uh, Marek, I see your hands up. Yeah, um, thanks, Scott. It was a great talk. Um, I was wondering if you had this many species, mm. 
how do you decide on um, on the way of initializing them, and how do you do this in an efficient manner? Um, I <clears throat> so all of the species which were new, I added code. So I I I in the auxiliary part of rows where you initialize them as like 10 to the minus 15. I just did that. Um, but there's actually code within your row suite, which, um, which, which the row suite GUI that you're editing corresponds to. So I didn't actually, you know, hand add them to the GUI each time. I okay. wrote a script which could write out the code uh, for all the species that I wanted to add. And then I just copy pasted that into the row suite. Okay. And so actually it's a fairly, fairly trivial to do. Um, this is kind of what I say in terms of working with the GUI rows is fine if you're just making a small nameless change here and there, but everything which is in the rows GUI has a set of scripts which correspond to what's in the GUI. And so if you want to do large changes or very repetitive changes, it's usually easier to actually just change the source code um, for those. Um, in terms of the ones which are then emitted, um, those ones will have their emissions and those emissions will then feed on to you know, change the tracer fields. That only matters for when you do your first, um, when you first do, do your first run because once you've done the first run, then you can have a dump file which uses the Chrystrat chemistry. And then you can actually use that to initialize all of them. So it's only when you add something new which doesn't exist in the dump file, which you have to have those auxiliary um, starting initialization options. And I think in, in UKCA, most species you can initialize to a constant small number and yeah. let them spin up. Some species, I think ozone, we, in the past, certainly we had to initialize it to something vaguely sensible. Um, but most of the species that Scott added here, were, were, you could just do to a, a, a con small constant number and let the model spin up, as Scott says. Great. Thanks. That's very helpful. 